Namaste everyone. My name is uh, Smriti Adi Narayanan and I'm the co-founder of Anadi Foundation. So welcome to this global virtual symposium on traditional knowledge systems based uh, education. So throughout the day, we have lined up really, really excellent speakers who have done some core research, field work, and have ensured that traditional wisdom stays uh, in the larger psyche. So the idea behind this conference uh, or this symposium is to synthesize various ideas that is coming from global cultures. So we have speakers from across the globe who will be sharing their uh, work as to how they worked for the transformation, preservation, and also the transmission of core thought processes of indigenous, native, or local uh, pedagogies and educational philosophies. So this uh, virtual symposium is hosted by the Center for Indigenous Knowledge Systems at Anadi Foundation, which we recently started, which will work towards creating a framework that brings together educational philosophies from various cultures, pedagogical approaches, content, storytelling, intergenerational transfer of knowledge, so that a model can be created for people to get inspired and create holistic learning spaces so that the future of the children is transformed. So Anadi Foundation was started in 2015 and uh, at the ashram we have a gurukulam which we started in 2021. It is an Indian knowledge system based gurukulam. And uh, we also have a goshala, which is we rear cows uh, here, making use of various sustainable practices within the ashram. As part of the symposium, uh, we have various moderators. So uh, this session by Professor Jacoba, uh, she is from New Zealand. Uh, and I invite Raja Lakshmi, who lives in New Zealand, but currently in Bharat, uh, to introduce the speaker and moderate the session and facilitate uh, this. Namaste. Welcome, Raji. Please introduce the speaker. Yes, thank you, ma'am. So a very warm greeting to all of you present here today. Uh, my name is Raja Lakshmi, or for short, it's Raji. Um, so I've been living in beautiful Ayotthaya, New Zealand for the past 14 years as a software developer, a woman's holistic coach, and a children's well-being and digital technology educator. So when the wonderful Anadi organization, uh, which is, they were part of my uh, Amrita University studies, when they contacted me and they um, asked for support in connecting with the experts in the field of indigenous education, that's when I started my search and thanks to technology, um, I started to connect with various academic professionals in New Zealand uh, who have made it their mis mission to represent their vast heritage into the New Zealand education system. So I'm very fortunate to have come across a very powerful, inspirational expert, Dr. Uh, Jacoba Matoba, Matobu. So she's the first pro vice chancellor Pacific at Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. She's an associate professor specializing in Pacifica early childhood education and Pacifica education research. She's of Samoan Dutch heritage, born and raised in New Zealand. Jacoba's passion for Pacifica education has steamed from personal experience navigating cultural, political, and social challenges in her own education and research journey. So Dr. Jacoba, it's my pleasure to meet you today online. I have been like going and finding more about you and I've watched your videos on YouTube and I can de definitely see that you have this strong connection to your ancestral wisdom, mother nature, and also your very beautiful divine um, soul through your videos. So we're very excited uh, to have you today and we look forward to learn more from you today. Thank you. Oh, Malo lovely soy for Malelangi Mama. Thank you so much for that lovely warm introduction, um, Raji. And it's wonderful to hear that you've had um, time in New Zealand, and that um, you know you're also making those connections uh, right across um, Te Moana Nui Akiwa, um, our land of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, 
Yes, so firstly, I'd like to open by acknowledging the organizers of this wonderful symposium, um, Bura Lakshmi, and the members of the Centre for Indigenous Knowledge Systems. Um, I appreciate your perseverance. I understand I've been a, it's been a little bit difficult to pin me down through the year, but I knew that I would share this presentation uh, before the end of the year, so it's a real honour to be here. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the Anadi Foundation and all of their work in terms of sustaining, revitalizing, ensuring that future generations have access to traditional knowledge systems um, there in India. So I'm going to kick us off. Um, there are some connections I'm sure that can be made um, across the Pacific and to where you are in the world. And some of the cultural artifacts might also share a synergy in the ways of being and knowing um, that are relevant in your cultural perspectives. So I want to share uh, this little sound with you. Mm -hmm. Ilele Pu, hear the call of the conch. Deep is the sound felt in your body, hear the call. Sensations under your skin, stirring movement in knowing self, calling upon ancestors, gods, spirit, time and space. Knowing does not belong to you alone. Deep in the earth, the call vibrates. It is felt under the feet of those before. Fanua, our earth, with its own life forces and flows, regenerates new life with old. Knowledge has constraints, unlike the wisdom of Fanua, our land. Deep is the breath you take to blow, and the winds around you share in your breath, to fill your lungs, to give life to your blood and brain. Breathe in your knowing, breathe out your wisdom, Generate understanding. Deep are the waters of Mwananui Akiwa. Ilelepu, the call of the conch, is another voice. It is a relational voice that binds us all. Mm -mm. So uh, this is my pepeha, and the term pepeha is used uh, for Indigenous peoples in New Zealand for tangata whenua or Māori people as a way to show connection to genealogy in your own positionality. So I share with you my pepeha. Ko kia vi toku maunga uh, o Samoa, ko rangitoto toku maunga o Aotearoa, ko eloloa toku awa, Ko Samoa toku iwi, ko si umu toku hapu, ko Yakoba matapo toku ingoa. My mountain in Samoa is Kiavi, and my mountain in New Zealand is Rangitoto. I have ancestral ties to Si Umu village, and on my father's side, uh, Leyden, Holland. I believe I am a daughter of Temuana Nuiya Kiwa, our beautiful P Pacific Ocean that binds locations oh, rather than rather than separates. <laughs> I'm the first associate professor in Pacific Early Childhood Education, and I have a deep love and affinity for Pacific philosophy. And I honestly believe that it started in my home with my mother as my first teacher. I'm aware that the symposium states traditional knowledge systems. However, I'd like to take up the position that Traditional knowledge at times can presuppose um, a particular connection to historical practices. Pacific scholars such as Albert Went and Abeli Ofa have actually warned us, um, particularly in how we frame the term traditional, not to fix ourselves on a past notion of practice or a cultural ideal, but rather look at tradition as potential traditional futures specifically, how we bring our indigenous ontologies and knowledge systems and wisdom into the present and carry it forward into the future. And this is about the spirit of connection that is embodied and embedded in genealogy. So I'm gonna just quickly talk a little bit now about the context of Aotearoa New Zealand. 
um, because it's important to set the scene for the context of where the research takes place, which I'm going to share with you shortly. So in the context of Aotearoa New Zealand, there is an inextricable link between Pacific people and Indigenous people of New Zealand. Um, the Pacific people in Indigenous way is termed Tangata Moana, people of the ocean. Tangata Whenua, is, as a um, translation, is people of this land, people who are Indigenous to Aotearoa New Zealand. This relationship is deeply rooted in ancestral and cultural connections. It is rooted through ocean navigation histories, as well as the post-colonial histories too, in contemporary contexts. The colonial era significantly impacted the Pacific people across the Pacific region, as well as Māori or tangata whenua in New Zealand, albeit in different ways. For Pacific people, colonialism often meant the establishment of European control over their home islands, which has resulted in economic exploitation, cultural erosion, and further migration. Um, Lua Manuvao Winnie Laban, who is an expert Pacific scholar, reminds us that in New Zealand, it is important to remember it is in the Pacific context. New Zealand is indeed a Pacific nation. So what does that mean for Pacific people living in New Zealand? It's realizing that Pacific people have a shared history with Indigenous people in the same respect, honoring Indigenous peoples of this land while we are also living here and calling New Zealand home. So I'm going to move now um, just to another wave of migration. I've talked about the navigation histories and that deep ancestral connection between Māori and their migration across the Pacific to New Zealand. Um, but I want to talk about a more recent wave of migration. So this is the Pacific migration wave from the 1950s to 1970s in New Zealand. Um, and really, this migration was spurred because of the increased demand of New Zealand's manufacturing sector, and it required um, semi-skilled workers, and New Zealand turned to people of the Pacific, um, A, because it was cost effective, and B, because our Pacific nations were close to New Zealand. It was easy to transport um, Pacific peoples here, um, and also it was about... Uh, ensuring that the needs within the manufacturing sector were, were met. Um, within New Zealand, though, um, there, were, there was an economic crisis um, that arose um, at this time, at the waves of migration, um, and it caused, it caused uh, quite a few issues politically um, across for Pacific people. Pacific people were seen as taking, taking valuable employment opportunities for, for New Zealand residents, although the majority of illegal working migrants at that time were actually from Europe and South America. Pacific peoples were targeted as the problem um, and the causes of the economic issues, and with that grew contentious labelling and shaming of Pacific peoples as overstayers. Um, in recent years, I believe it was about Two years ago now, our Prime Minister at the time, Jacinda Ardern, actually did a public apology to the Pacific people in New Zealand for um, just for the treatment of Pacific people at that time, particularly the dawn raids. So there is um, there is an unsettling history of Pacific people and how they've been treated, um, you know, in this particular wave of migration to New Zealand. Um, the reason I bring this up is because my mother actually came in this wave of migration and spent many years working in a factory. And I do enjoy poetry as a way of expressing. And I want to share this poem with you that I wrote um, for my mother, thinking about her migration story to New Zealand. It is called Feel My Reach. Daughter, hold my hand, be still, listen to me. These hands of mine have much to say. They will tell you of worlds before and of your ancestors past. Each wrinkle, each line, a collective spirit etched in body and mind. Oh, these stories that these hands can tell. 
These hands are not mine alone. I've shared my hands in sustaining life, many years of sowing, of healing, of gifting and giving, in pushing strong fists forward, fighting for rights to be heard. So for you in this place in Aotearoa belong, to have your voice known. Oh, these stories these hands can tell. Take my hand, granddaughter, let me lead you along. These hands of yours are young and your stories yet to come. Your hands are mine and mine are yours. Use your hands wisely in the choices you make. Push strong fists forward so generations to come will feel your reach and know of your wisdom of worlds before and of your ancestors past. Oh, these stories these hands will tell. So I want to move now into um, just some broad definitions around transnational indigeneity. Um, so a transnational perspective is particularly beneficial for minority groups living away from their ancestral lands. And it emphasizes the strength and resilience inherent in maintaining cultural, social and political connections across national boundaries. Now this approach highlights um, how such communities can actually leverage their transnational networks for mutual support, for cultural preservation, for economic opportunities, and of course, political advocacy. It acknowledges that while these groups may be physically distant from their ancestral territories, transnational ties enable them to maintain a strong sense of identity and community and solidarity which is an important part of the history of Pacific transnational communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The other concept I want to touch on quickly as well is transnational indigeneity. So adding indigeneity um, with reference to transnational. This is about understanding the advocacy of indigenous people's rights and issues which transcend beyond national boundaries. So this concept recognizes that indigenous communities, um, while often separated by borders, actually share common experience, such as the history of colonization or cultural suppression or struggles for autonomy and rights. And it emphasizes the interconnectedness of indigenous struggles across the globe, um, and also bringing forward a collective approach to address rights and issues, which I feel like this whole symposium is also a part of. Um, you'll notice in the, um, in the slide here, I've included the United Nations Declaration's Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which, which is such a fundamental document in terms of really validating from a point of strength the rights of Indigenous peoples right across the world. And in terms of thinking about this in the way that it is lived and embodied within education itself, another text here is Decolonizing Methodologies, which is uh, published, uh, written by Professor uh, Linda Tuhiwai Smith. And this is another really powerful text to um, support Indigenous research, particularly in pushing back against Eurocentric knowledge systems which permeate um, academic um, approaches and um, literacies around academic knowledge. We think about as well here, um, there's another two key texts down here which are about um, Pacific personhood and relationality. These books are wonderful in framing um, Pacific Indigenous ontologies and ways of being. So moving back now to the context of early childhood education, this here is a little bit of a timeline of the history of the development of early childhood education in New Zealand. So you'll notice in 1889, there was the establishment of New Zealand's first kindergarten in Dunedin. Um, there was uh, the launch of a creche in Wellington. These are also times where um, there is a strong influence internationally. So the Froebel um, philosophy in terms of a play-based um, curriculum, thinking about the way that in New Zealand, uh, there is a strong influence from other international sort of um, bodies and discourse around education. It's not up until um, we see the launch of New Zealand's first early childhood curriculum which is in 1996, the draft was in 1993, and then subsequently the one in green here 
um, was launched in uh, 2017. So within all of this, the establishment of Pacific Early Childhood Education um, was in 1972. So these are, um, this was a Samoan Early Childhood Centre, which spoke, where teachers and practice within the centre was full of Samoan. So it's realising too that although um, Pacific um, migrants were quite new to New Zealand at that time, given that wave of migration, there was still a really strong commitment to ensure that children growing up in New Zealand, Pacific children growing up in New Zealand, still had access to their language, to their culture, to their identity, and of course, spirituality. So many of the Pacific Early Childhood Services which were launched around that time, they were actually by our mamas, our grandmothers, our mothers, our aunties, and also church leaders supporting as well, um, ensuring that you know our young children had access to these cultural ways of knowing and being um, and growing up in New Zealand. So some of the tensions today, so let's move on, you know, 35 years to 40 years later, what is the landscape for Pacific Early Childhood Education in New Zealand? Well, currently it's sad to say that there's only 69 Pacific Early Childhood Services in New Zealand that actually integrate 51% or more of Pacific languages. So these are our um, full immersion to bilingual services. And that's only 1.5% of the total of early childhood services in New Zealand. Um, there are 4,569 early learning services in New Zealand. I do want to note, though, that in, in New Zealand as well, there are realm nations. So we have Tokelau, the Cook Islands, and Niue, who are realm nations with New Zealand. And it's important to note that all three of these nations, their Pacific languages are listed as endangered with UNESCO. And actually, there's a higher number of these populations actually living in New Zealand than in their respective island. So I do question, what does that mean for future generations to come? Will they still be able to access their language? Will intergenerational practices still be able to be retained? And it is a worry when you see a culture um, running the risk of being lost. So we're kind of at that precipice at this point. <clears throat> and I feel that in education, there should be a strong ethical obligation to retaining those cultures specifically. So I'm going to keep moving on here. <clears throat> Coming back to um, Professor Linda Tuhiwai's articulation of decolonization, you know, she reminds us that it is about reclaiming, renaming, reframing our narratives. Quite often, too, as um, my, you know, migrant communities or minority groups, the narrative that is shared across media, shared across, you know, the with general public is is a narrative written by somebody else. It's a narrative created by somebody else. How do we how do we dismantle that? And how do we ensure that we are owners of our narrative? Um, and that's really important when we think about the framing of education. She reminds us that we need to understand, dismantle the legacies of colonial oppression and rejuvenate indigenous identities and practices. And I think this is what we're all here for, right? The symposium is all about, you know, the rejuvenating of indigenous identities and practices in our teaching context. So I want to, um, I always ask this question, it's one of my favorite questions, but when we're learning something, whether it's in the classroom or, or whichever context, you know, we might ask ourselves, whose philosophy of education counts and why? You know, what are the philosophies that inform our approaches to teaching and learning? You know, how have we arrived here to accept some of these practices as norm? So I wanted to kind of do a bit of a deep dive into Pacific education and the nature of knowledge. Um, you know, these are big epistemological questions, but, you know, I want to recognize here that before colonization in the Pacific, you know, um, the perspective of indigenous knowledge systems are thousands of years old. 
And in a short time frame, you know, within 100 years to 150 years, we see colonization of the Pacific, and then we see the introduction of Western education as well as Christianity. So not only um, shifting the nature of knowledge and how it's um, how it's sort of anchored in the very fabric of society across our Pacific Indigenous nations, we're also seeing a shift in theology, you know, a shift in 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 theology towards Christianity. The other aspect we see too is a shift in, um, uh, of course, the introduction of capitalism and how that shifts economic and political I ideologies. Um, um, capitalism is very individualistic <laughs> in terms of a, a of a society which is, fabric is very collective. What does that mean in the way that we think about the value of things, of the world and of each other? And also the way in which um, perceived powerful knowledges of Western science and philosophy, specifically disciplinary knowledge, come into it. And we see that all the way through education from early childhood, you know, your compulsory schooling all the way up to university. We see the presence of, um, of Western knowledge systems. So I'm going to move on here to this wee diagram here. So this is a little um, juxtaposition, let's say, which I've um, adapted from a few different sources, but just wanting to do a little bit of a comparison in terms of um, 19th century pedagogy from the perspective of traditional Western education and the perspective of traditional indigenous education in the Pacific. So if we look at the role of teachers, this is really interesting. You know, the role of teacher was generally family members. They're your cultural experts. And the environment is also a teacher. Um, and teachers can also be learners. Um, from the traditional Western sense, you know, the role of the teacher is often strangers, disconnected to the familial context, they'll be qualified, so a member of a specific profession, they'd be paid for the service that they offer, um, not necessarily connected to the learner by personal interest, um, and they'll also hold, you know, a, a teacher identity. So the other aspect too is thinking about the learner. So the learner can also be a teacher, you know, connected to the family and ancestors. And here has mana. So mana um, is really what is your divine right, I guess, or what, what you hold in terms of your, your presence and your strength and the uniqueness that is you, your life force. Um, the other aspect here is looking at learning. Um, so from a traditional sense, it is relational, communal, participatory, can be restricted because within traditional knowledge systems too, uh, there are sacred knowledges, sacred knowledges that aren't always shared openly for everyone. Um, they need to be treated with high regard and care. Um, and so if we look at the Western um Western no, traditional Western notions of education, this is 19th century, by the way, um, reminding you of that. You know, it's individualistic, competitive, standardized, institutionalized. The interesting thing is when I look at those aspects, I can see how they've actually endured and we still carry a strong presence of those aspects in education today. All right, so I'm going to keep us moving. Um, I wanted to share with you this beautiful um, image. It is a digital image created by Joseph Ravlich, who is a young emerging uh, Pacific artist. He's Cook Island. Um, and so for Pacific peoples, kinship extends to non-human worlds and a deep-rooted, inclusive of the environment and the cosmos. Pacific indigenous knowledge systems, they ground genealogy as a construct that connects people as kin with the world. The relational ontology that is present here realizes that we are co-existential. As human beings, we are co-existential. We are co-evolutionary with the world. And it is this ecology of relations that sustains us and the world that we live in. 
Kōnai Helu Tharman shares this beautiful poem. You can probably tell by now that I really love poetry. Um, I do write a little bit of poetry. But this, this poem really eloquently positions the nature of thinking, not only as a human capacity. And Kōnai Helu Tharman says, you say that you think, therefore you are, but thinking belongs in the depths of the earth. We simply borrow what we need to know, these islands, the sky, the surrounding sea, the trees, the birds, and all that are free, the misty rain, the surging river, caused by the blowholes, a hidden flower. They have their own thinking. They are different frames of mind that cannot fit in a small, selfish world. So I'd like to now move on to the research study. So leading up now, we've talked a little bit about the context of um, New Zealand, uh, particularly Pacific migration. We've talked a little bit about the sort of evolution of early childhood education in New Zealand. And I want to move now to this recent study, um, Bepe Mea Mea, which is an indigenous, Samoan indigenous uh, philosophy and framework for Samoan children under two growing up in New Zealand. I want to acknowledge my co-investigators, um, uh, Dr. Fa'asaulala um, Tangoi Lelangi Leota, and also Dr. Tafili Utumapu McBride, um, just here in this image. So this research project was co-designed with six Samoan early childhood centres and six English medium early childhood centres. And a common thread that these centres shared was that they had quite a, a, a they had a good number of, of Samoan infants and toddlers enrolled in their services. And what this um, study set out to do was to develop um, the first indigenous framework for Samoan um, infants and toddlers Samoan children under two that could be utilized in an early childhood context with both Samoan teachers as well as English medium teachers. So um, this framework had to be agile, it had to have the depth, but also it had to be uh, adaptable um, in a way that all teachers of Samoan and, and Samoan infants and toddlers could actually engage with. So I do want to signal here before moving on a little bit more about our early childhood curriculum. So um, Te Whareke was the first um, bicultural curriculum in the world, actually. So it's written in both Te Reo Māori, which is the indigenous language of New Zealand, as well as um, in English medium. Um, within Within Te Whareke, and because of its bicultural nature, there are Māori concepts within it, and it also has Western educational theories as well. So the Māori view of the child here um, that is articulated in Te Whareke is interconnected with histories, with spirituality and the land, emphasising the collective over individual identity. From a Te Ao Māori worldview, um, children are seen as the embodiment of ancestors and the future. So this view informs Te Whareke, which regards the child as mukapuna, and it honours the spiritual, genealogical and geographical connections that are relevant to the child. And understanding this is crucial because it shapes the curriculum. And we can also think about this too from a Pacific early childhood education perspective and how Indigenous philosophies can actually shape our understanding of children and how we preserve intergenerational knowledge, how we incorporate our language and culture, and as well as balance diverse educational ideologies that are present within education. So why infant and toddler pedagogy for Samoan within a New Zealand context? So um, Samoan, so, there is, uh, out of the Pacific populations in New Zealand, the Samoan population makes 48.7%. So um, the majority of Pacific peoples in New Zealand are Samoan. Um, and it's also realizing too that the majority of Samoan growing up in New Zealand are also um, 
quite young. So it's a young and um, young and fast growing um, demographic. So it's understanding that with that in mind, um, what are we doing in education to ensure the cultural um, sustainability for Samoan children growing up in New Zealand? Um, in early childhood education in New Zealand, there's a plethora of international discourse, um, particularly for infants and toddlers. A lot of these philosophies are borrowed, um, and they also run the risk of creating universal notions of development for infants and toddlers. Um, and Ramaka and Glasgow have written about this as well from a Pacific position, saying that more research needs to be done around Pacific ethnic specific philosophy and pedagogy. So this research project actually contributes to that. Um, and it's ensuring that, you know, within an ECE context, um, a strong foundation for well-being, belonging and identity can be established and supported for our young Samoan children growing up in New Zealand. So just to introduce you to some of our centres, and this is a bit of a snapshot um, of all of us. So um, from the Samoan centres, we had six centres there in the left column. And on the right column are our English medium centres. Now, these centres were partnered up within the same community so that at the end of the project, they could retain their relationship with their centres and that they have another new connection in their community. So it's, it's important to note as well that there was a wide diversity of teacher representation within the project and it illuminated intersectional cultural nuances such as teachers who were New Zealand born Samoan or teachers who were Samoan born, um, as well as elders, um, Samoan elders and um, knowledge custodians, as well as the younger Samoan generation of teachers. And with our English medium centres, there were also migrant communities. We had Indian teachers, we had teachers from South Africa, um, so there was quite a good representation across as well as the Philippines. Um, so you can see it's quite dynamic in a sense of, of, of um, a broad range of, of cultural diversity. Um, with one common thread to, to learn more and to ensure that our young Samoan infants and toddlers are um, encouraged to, to connect with their culture within the centre context. So conceptualizing Bepe Mea Mea, so rather than saying infants and toddlers, the Samoan term is Bepe Mea Mea. For our teachers and research, the dialogue moved freely between multiple, multiple paradigms. So we engaged in ongoing what we call talanoa as a research methodology, um, and it encourages the flow of dialogue and co-construction and meaning making. But what came out of the conversations <clears throat> and the flow of dialogue was the importance of intergenerational practices um, and as well as the, the position of the natural environment. Um, one of the teachers said, It is important that infants and toddlers experience the morning dew when we sing to them outside. So they'd take the children outside and sing to them in the morning to feel the mist of the morning dew. Infants and toddlers are saolotonga. They are an expression of freedom that carry the continue of freedom for the whole collective or the whole family. So these are just some of the concepts that emerged through the, through the dialogue. Um, throughout the first phase of the research, teachers shared many references to the embodied dimensions of their teaching practice. And there was a particular attention to the nonverbal embodied cues of the child. The embodied pedagogies of infants and toddlers, they were theorized through Samoan indigenous thinking, meaning that they were intuitively connected to the interactions between the body and the environment. Thus the influence of the hands or touch pedagogy surfaced, the way in which hands communicate with infants and toddlers and play a vital role in ensuring they're cared for through a putsi putsi, which is nurturing, loving and gentle interactions. 
Teachers discuss the skin of the infants as mo'a mo'a, which is meaning fresh and supple, and that the pedagogy of the hands is part of the first experiences of touch communication for the child. So the way that we touch and, and care and hold our children should match the, the suppleness of their skin or the gentleness of their skin. Infants experience a touch after birth, which call, is called fesi'i, and it's the way that we carry our infants. And those, the way that infants are carried must speak of a lufa of love. Um, and this is another practice that teachers carry through into their practice and day-to-day -day teaching. Also realizing that it was important to ensure that the timing and the pace of these embodied practices followed the rhythm of the child. There were also other hand skin touch pedagogy, particularly around traditional healing, which is baby massage or mili mili, when you rub your hands together to create warmth before picking up or holding a child. I wanna move now into one of the key findings, which is around the weaving of the falapepe, which is a traditional baby mat, um, which is given at the time of the birth of a child. And this mat is woven usually by the mother or grandmother. And while the, while the mother is pregnant, this mat is woven in love and the stories are woven into the mat. The genealogy of that child and the future stories are woven into that mat. So that mat, which will one day hold the child in their early years journey, is also a mat that connects the child to their genealogy. Also where the mat, um, where the mat, the, the laufala or the leaves of the mat is grown is usually in a land or ele ele, we call it in Samoan, that is of a location uh, significant to the child or their family. So it is a it is a physical manifestation of a of a connector to the land, to the history, uh, and to the life force, um, which also the mat holds. So um, throughout the first year of the study, we had master weavers come in to our research community and teach us how to weave these mats. And then teachers were able to go back to their centers and teach their Samoan parents about weaving. Now, these mats um, are actually a dying art in Samoa. They're not practiced as much. So it's part of a revitalization process as well. So from this mat, we were able to create a framework, a framework for Samoan infants and toddlers for uh, teachers to be able to adapt in their practice. And there are five key stones. We call them ma'atatao. So the, the, the rocks are actually securing rocks. While you're weaving, if you don't have the rocks in place, your weaving becomes, you kind of lose the integrity of the weaving. So your weaving can go a bit crooked. You have a bit of gaps. <laughs> it can, it, it, it kind of disrupts the weaving, but when you have those rocks that are securing the weaving in place, your weaving is more accurate, it is more refined, and it upholds the integrity of the mat. So these five securing rocks, or the ma'atatao we call them, um, are a metaphor for the five key points that we've included and co-created in this pedagogical framework. So the first one is Tofa Manino, and that is about Samoan indigenous knowledge, philosophy, and wisdom. The Fava Ole Fa'afutang Fa'atufunganga, that is about Samoan pedagogy, and it includes the language and relational ethics. Fa'asino Manga is all about identity that grounds, grounds the child in their genealogy and spirituality. Angatau Sili is about the living of Samoan values and custom. And Paipaenga is a strong early childhood context um, that is connected to community, but also connected to the environment. And just in closing, I want to share a poem, a poem that speaks to um, Pepe Mea Mea. We knew you before your birth, your value and collective worth, and dreams of the living you bind, 
the past, present and future divide. Like the whanua we walk and whispers of ancestors talk. You are imagined in form, the weaving that adorns, belonging your birthright, inheritance and foresight. Intergenerational reaching, you come into being. Fafate tele lover, thank you everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jacoba. There were a lot of aha moments for me. Um, I have a one-year-old daughter um, and I, because I like to educate myself on the various aspects of early childhood education. So obviously, like you said, there's so many universal, like, uh, like Montessori-based, right brain education, all these things are there. And because it's so aware, um, it's so out there, that's what we quickly learn and try to implement. But now that um, you have shared your vast um, Samoan uh, pedagogy, it's like amazing. So in New Zealand, we've got a beautiful public library system. And while I go and get the um, cultural books, I go and also find like Nani, Miha, that's the grandmother's Ayotera book. So it's very uh, heartwarming to know that there is so much of spiritual connection, mother nature connection um, in the Samoan culture. And definitely when you bring up children with that kind of attitude, they will be world-class citizens. So thank yeah. you so much uh, for your presentation. Is thank there you, anyone who... Anyone would like to ask any questions? Mm -hmm. any, anything that um, you felt very connected with? Your poems are very beautiful. Um, <laughs> in the Indian um, tradition also, we have like they're called shlokas and they got a lot of values in, um, in, in it. So it's very nice to hear your poems. Yeah, may, may, may I uh, yes. just add something here? Um, like you said, the aha moments were way too many, especially the way we are so connected. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. Some terms also, like we say papa for a baby and they say pepe to that extent. I mean, I, I can't believe you're so far away. <laughs> I really can't believe that. It's simply mind blowing to know that we are so connected, right? Yes. Thank you so much. I truly, truly uh, learned so much in a very enjoyable way too. And I'm sure that um, your projects are going to take off in a very big way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. So someone has also mentioned in the chat um, that it's very heartening to see prenatal connections uh, at such depth. Yes, the weaving story. So how you let the grandmothers do the weaving so that they bring in the story, um, amazing. I was, um, when I gave birth in the birthing unit, I could see the cultural and I, I did see the pepper, the basket also um, that was produced for us. So yes. thank you for that. Um, say yes. any Dharma else? has a question, I guess. So, Dharma? Um, thank you, Professor, for, for the lecture today. Um, so just a quick question. Does the New Zealand Human Rights Commission take cognizance of your research and provide a policy support in that sense? Thank you. What a wonderful question. So actually, as of today, the report has just been published. So it's one of these things that through the research process, we've just been waiting to sort of close off officially the project. And we would love to kind of move this forward into the um, early childhood space in terms of informing curriculum development, informing practice. In terms of a policy, though, um, it is a little bit of a sensitive one because as you know, tra in a transnational indigenous perspective, it is first about honoring tangata whenua, so the indigenous people of New Zealand first. So what I understand in terms of um, the, the human rights and the way that influences the way that education is formed here, um, and we're also currently going through some political changes with a new government, um, is that ensuring that Māori children have access to language, culture and their identity. So there are some core fundamentals there that need to be adhered first to the Indigenous peoples here in New Zealand. Um, I'm not sure yet about policy um, being written up or, or documented or drafted for Samoan language um, specifically. There is a Pacific language 
um, framework. There are a whole range of different frameworks in New Zealand through the Ministry for Pacific Peoples. But yeah, that's definitely a space I'd love to see develop. So yeah, no, that's a really good question. <laughs> Anyone else would like to? There's a question in the chat box. Uh, what difference uh, does tra traditional education have on the Samoan children as opposed to other children uh, who uh, didn't get that kind of an education? Yeah, that's a really important one because, you know, what we're finding from, um, you know, reports around youth well-being and also data that's speaking about... Um, yeah, particularly about youth well-being or Pacific youth well-being in New Zealand, identity and access to culture and language is a really big one. So what we do know is that children who um, do not feel that sense of connection or feel sort of dislocated to their culture and identity and um, as well as community tend to um, struggle with issues around well-being and they carry on all the way through into adult life so you know we know that there's a lot of issues around that so um in terms of this study children who are secure in their well-being you know there is evidence to say that actually you're securing your well-being you thrive academically you thrive socially emotionally all of these other aspects it can influence so we know that um, we know that there's a lot more work that needs to be done in that space to ensure that our children are given, you know, the, the most optimal opportunities right from the start. Yeah. So we, I think, uh, thank, thank you, Professor uh, Jacoba. I, I'm sure there are more questions. And uh, throughout the day, we are going to have more and more of these aha moments. Uh, and it's truly, you know, one uh, globe together, uh, though we are located 